Welcome back to our next Respect Project talk with Special Olympics on the topic of resilience. And I am so excited to be here with three Special Olympics athletes and leaders, as well as Timothy Shriver, who's the chairman of the board. But to talk about resilience through the scope of the 52 years of the Special Olympics becoming the global authorities on health and education and leadership for people with intellectual disabilities. I've had the pleasure of getting to know Kira Byland, who's in Great Britain, and Nasha Derrera, who's in Zimbabwe, and Emmanuel Souza, who's in Brazil. And to call them my friends and to say I'm now part of Special Olympics as a family. And the one thing that really impressed me in getting to know these beautiful human beings is what the world needs now is Special Olympics more than ever. And I think we are gonna start with a really important question, which is to explain to everybody that's with us, but also you know, the world at large, what are the guiding principles of Special Olympics? You guys are a family. I'm privileged to be in this family and I'm so inspired by each of you. But I think the world, if they had a deeper understanding of the guiding principles of this family, this organization, we could change the world you could change the world. So Kira, I wanted to ask you just to start, if you could share with us the guiding principles of Special Olympics. Of course, so the Special Olympics, as we know, is very big, but these are three guiding principles that we have, is education and awareness. And for me, this is educating programs on athlete leaders and seeing what they can do and help create opportunities for them. Number two would be training. And again, this is letting our athlete leaders be trained in whatever they want to be. If that's a coach, a judge, or assistant judge, that should be up to the athletes and Special Olympics helping them and encourage them to do so. And the third one is to create meaningful roles. All our athletes, they want to be wanted and they want to be seen as equals to everybody else without disabilities. And for that, it's organizations allowing people with intellectual disabilities that opportunity to happen and not being taken as a token gesture. And for all of these principles to happen is really important. And that helps with an organize, organizational shift. And my example of that is in 2016, me and some Special Olympics athletes in Europe and Eurasia, we were invited to a leadership conference. We didn't know each other, we we're very new, and the staff led the conference. Over to 2018, two year difference, we were in Montenegro where the athletes, we designed it, we created the whole conference and it was our conference and we were so happy to lead it and we were so proud. I love that. And thank you so much for sharing that, Kira. I was thinking so much about um, Eunice Kennedy Shriver, who is the founder of Special Olympics. And she said this quote, which I think also goes to, you know, belonging in every aspect of life. And, and for us to have a conversation about inclusion, I just wanna read this, this quote. The right to play on any playing field, you have earned it. The right to study in any school, you have earned it. The right to hold a job, you have earned it. And the right to be anyone's neighbor, you have earned it. And that's a lot of what you're talking about. And it makes me think so much of our conversation, Nasha, um, you know, your journey um, to feel like you were worthy to have a life, to have a voice, to be an athlete, to learn. And I just wanted to ask you to share with everybody here a little bit of your background and you can talk about Special Olympics, but also just how you came to um, encourage your school to let you run and to, to learn to write and to read. Um, if you could share that with everybody, I think it would be very inspiring. Thank you so much. Uh, first and foremost, I'd like to thank Special Olympics for giving us a voice as athletes to advocate for inclusion for everyone around the world. You know, I was born in Zimbabwe. I was born in Ghetto. 
you know, as I told you earlier, that a, a ghetto is a place where no one sees the best, everyone sees the worst. Even the language, the language is the language of a victim, not a language of a victor. So, and the, above, above, uh, above from more, I was, uh, I don't know my father. My mother passed on when I was two years old. So I was left with no one, only uh, my foster care with my step grandmother. Uh, she strived hard to raise me up, but I didn't have that much opportunity to be included at the community. I had an opportunity to go at a unified school, but I was within a separate class where we are not allowed to participate with other uh, students, mainstream students. So we were left as uh, outcast at a school mm -hmm. whereby even when we want to do sports, there was no way we can do sports. So I still remember the first time I had to challenge the mainstream school. I was, I was, they told me young men, we don't want anyone from special class. You're a disgrace. You don't qualify to compete with us. And uh, it was painful to me. Then I decided that uh, without any coach, without anyone to instruct me, I think I, I need to start training or to try start train myself. So I started training myself. Then I had to go back to the to the mainstream and say that I can do it. I can I can try to join your team. Then uh, they didn't allow me uh, to participate until I worked extremely hard. The next time I went and they, then there, was, there was someone who said, just give him a chance to compete. I think he can do better. Then uh, they give me the, their best and I didn't do well. Then say, young man, you're good for nothing. And you know, I cried. I, I told myself, you know, at it, 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 it community level where I stay, they say that this young man is, is useless. So when I used when I used to train, they used to see me training all along. They say just you know uh, talk to themselves and say you don't know him. He's crazy. He's from special class. He's crazy. He's from special class. So, but I didn't I didn't tie up. I didn't give up on training myself to become a better athlete. Next time I went back and I said I need to I need to 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 challenge you guys so that you can see I can do it as well. And they denied until uh, somebody just advocate for me, let him run. And uh, I surprised everyone there. They say, ah, he's doing good, he's a good. Then they included me. And uh, it happened then when Special Olympics was introduced at my school. That, that was a life changing moment. You know, that was a life changing moment in that I advocated uh, for sport to be included to the mainstream from special class. And that was a, uh, you know, it was a miracle on its own because that's when the, everything changed. But I tell you, of, uh, back then it was not that easy, that smooth. So I had to thank Special Olympics. I had to thank Eunice Kenneth Shriver for starting this uh, wonderful organization that has changed pe people like me. You know, uh, if I tell you, if I, take you back from 10 years, 12 years back, you'll cry. Maybe I was supposed to be a street kid by now. Maybe I was supposed to be in the streets, even in terms of speaking English. English is not the first language where I stay, where I was. When I used to speak in English, I used to speak broken English. People used to say, this one is crazy, but you know, uh, it's a miracle. I had to say that what Special Olympics has done in my life. You are such a beautiful light, Nasha. I, every time we talk, I am so overwhelmed with a sense of newfound determination in my own personal life as well. And the universal need to have that conversation um, for us to listen to each other and to have deep conversation um, so that we can all be seen and heard. And, and when we speak, I feel so inspired by you. Um, I want to just talk a little bit about that and pivot over to Manu and ask you, you know, about your determination personally and how Special Olympics became a big part of your life. And also, if you want to talk a little bit about your family, I know you had a lot of family support um, in your childhood and, and so on and as an athlete. Yes, yeah, so when I was two years old, uh, I was in coma for a week and then the doctor said, my parents that we need to to move to a new city to a calmer city 
because I used to live in Rio in an apartment. It was really hot weather and uh, I wasn't feeling good there. And then my parents left their job behind, left their life behind just to take care of me. And then we came to Rio de Ostras. It is three hours by car from Rio. And then uh, I got a lot better here. My, my mom um, got the chance to, to meet some people from the church that we were going. And then um, they asked her to, to found an organization here in my city to take care of some people with disabilities, all disabilities. And then um, she, she was needing to take care of me, medical assistance. And also their families was also needing medical assistance for their children. So she, she found it here. And then when I was seven years old, I started practicing sports. Uh, I was seeing that I wasn't, I wasn't different. I wasn't like uh, someone else. I was, I was part of something, but I never had the chance to, to be a, in a leadership role. And it, I never thought that I could be possible to be a, a leader. That's what, when it, Special Olympics came to my city to, to do a co-training here for, for some coaches. And then they, they invited us to represent the, the soccer match. And then my life has completely changed. Um, I used to be very, very shy and I never had the chance to, to say hello to people because I was always hiding. And then um, when I, I got in Special Olympics, I got more confident. Uh, I got uh, people motivating me, supporting me. And not only my family, but also my second family, this is Special Olympics. I found a place that I can be myself without being afraid to be judged. I found a place that I am respected for who I am. And I found a place that is training me to support more and more athletes. And uh, I, just, I just want to, to show the other athletes that everybody's capable. Everybody uh, here, are, are, we are family here. So you don't need to feel alone. You don't need to, to be afraid of being who you are just 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 have on us just count on us because we are here for for the athletes we are here for the families and we are here we are here for the volunteers and everybody that care that wants to participate in special olympics thank you so much emmanuel for sharing that i really appreciate that and and we've talked a lot about you know feeling um, so quiet in your childhood that you were excluded um, and that you really found, like you said, a family in Special Olympics. And you know, to talk about that just from the world perspective, how much we need to help each other and lift each other up, um, you know, we need to encourage each other. And Special Olympics has been a place of great encouragement for each of you. But then you reach your hand back and you encourage everybody else behind you and you lift them and you pull them to the finish line. And Kira, you said to me, um, you know, that you've won so many gold medals, it's time for you to make room for other people. And I just want to say thank you for that. I want to say thank you to each of you for encouraging all the other athletes um, because this is the encouragement the world really needs. And Tim, I just want to talk to you about, obviously, this is um, a family, Special Olympics is a family, but it was also started by your family. Um, and how can this, um, these guiding principles and this way of treating each other with this encouragement and this inclusion change the world? I know you and I have talked about always caring about changing the world. And you've certainly been doing that your whole life. So, um, you know, just to, to talk back to, about the history of Special Olympics a little bit as well. Yeah, well, thanks, Elizabeth. And um, I, I, you know, as I was listening, you know, Kira and Nasha and Emmanuel to you three, I was thinking to myself, I should just turn my camera off and mute <laughs> and just disappear and just do what I usually do. I don't know if you could see me, but I was taking notes as you guys were talking. Um, you know, I just want to just 
I, I don't know, for whatever it's worth, I just want to remind people that have joined us, Elizabeth, and, you know, for, because of your great work, remind people how many stereotypes have been shattered in the last 15 minutes. I don't mean, you know, replace, I mean, shattered, <laughs> shattered, Yeah. you know, just blown out of the water. Uh, and, and you heard the stereotypes, they exist. Uh, they're what led Kira, your situation, Nasha, your heartbreaking situation, this idea of being labeled, told uh, you're, you're a disgrace. Imagine just shattering that uh, language. Imagine shattering the language of people with their life. How, how, two of you at least are bilingual. Uh, Elizabeth, I don't know if you're bilingual. Uh, I'm not. But not, I was going to say no, but <laughs> Nasha has more intellectual skills than I do. <laughs> I mean, we talk about multiple forms of intelligence, emotional intelligence. You, you've just yeah. seen, you know, Rhodes Scholar, PhD level emotional intelligence, wisdom, uh, compassion, uh, strength, perseverance, grit, resilience. You talk about admiring resilience and people say, well, I want to watch, you know, some FIFA star or some NBA star. Bull! <laughs> The best, most resilient athletes in the world are on the screen right here. I'm not saying compared to somebody else. I'm saying in the world. Yes. So these, these, are, these are moments in which I hope people go, whoa, I got to think differently. I have, to, I have to see the world differently. Look, at, listen to what Kira said. You know, I, we went to a conference. Everybody was there to help us and told us what to do. No, <laughs> no. I got to think differently. Blow up that idea. You well, it, it's, it's really interesting what you're saying about shattering these, these uh, concepts and just into smithereens because I was looking at your Instagram this week and it's um, World Down Syndrome Day today. That's right. And you talked about Rachel. Um, will you share with everybody the phenomenal accomplishments of this, this girl? This... Well, I, I, I'll go to her in a second, but let me, let me, can I answer your first question just for a second? Because I want to go back a little bit to, to how we get to this place and, yeah. I, and I want to make one correction because all all three of the athlete leaders here have thanked Special Olympics and uh, while I love the idea that the organization or the movement gets credit it's not it, the thanks go the other way really it's this is a movement of gratitude to the athletes you have taken the big chance you have bucked the big wave of negativity. And there are thousands of us, millions of us who can't do that, who are too scared, too lonely, too locked up to try again and take a chance on the world. And each of the three of you have said, no, I'm not too scared. I'm going to take another chance. I'm going to step out again, even though all these things have happened. I'm going to go for it again. So this is a movement of enormous gratitude. I like to say that Special Olympics is seen as a movement for people with intellectual differences, and it is. But it is also a movement from them. And we've had a, uh, an A-plus level seminar in what people who are Special Olympics athletes can teach, not can learn, not can benefit from, you guys all said thank you. I just wanna make a big, big thank you back, okay? So this is, a, this is the, the beautiful karma of giving and receiving at the same time. Uh, you maybe say that you've received, Kara, you've received your gold medals. Uh, Manuel, you've received the chance to be an athlete. Nasha, you've received the chance to, to speak on the world stage, but you've given just as much as you've received and the, and, the, and the energy goes both ways. That's living, you know, that's being fully alive. If you ask me, my mom believed this in her soul in a time when it was almost unthinkable. You know, in the sixties, in the United States, uh, institutions, these were places where people would go to live their entire life, removed from their family, removed from their homes, streets, never to ride a school bus, never to go to a movie, never to go out to a restaurant, never to have Thanksgiving uh, dinner together, never, ever, ever, in many cases, to see your family again. They were huge in 1968. In fact, there were more people in institutions in that year than any other year in history, almost 200,000 locked up forever. And my mom said no. 
it's not fair, it's not just, and it's not true to the faith I have. This is my mom speaking to my experience. All of the scientists and doctors and politicians who think that's the solution, you're all wrong. You're all wrong. And where did she get the evidence? She had no studies. She just had a heart empowered by, uh, outraged by, supercharged by uh, her own knowledge that there was goodness in all these folks who were locked up, that they needed to come out. Um, so, you know, that starts in 1968 with one event. Elizabeth, as you know, in a normal year, we have over 100,000 events every single year. So Special Olympics is not like the Olympics right. once every two years. We're once every six minutes. Uh, and although, I'm very, although I'm very excited to be at the World Games with you guys in Berlin in 2023. You can, so. We do the big events, but we also do the events in your neighborhood. We're the Olympics next yeah. door. We're the Olympics on the big stage for sure. Uh, we've had games, World Games in Abu Dhabi recently. We've had them in China, in Japan, in Greece, all these countries, Ireland obviously the United States, uh, and the list goes on, Austria. Uh, these are countries that have all welcomed the big stage. And I think my mom would be, well, I know she's, she was proud because she would go to all those games while she was alive. She never missed, really, um, until the very end of her life. But, uh, you know, she would be proud of the big stage. But what she would really be proudest of is the voices and energy of the athletes, and in particular, all those parents who fight so hard every day. You know, Emmanuel, you're describing your family, uh, fighting, working, giving things up for you. What a beautiful example of love. And, um, you know, I think you guys can see behind me this book, The Call to Unite. I, I'm, we're not, I'm not here to plug it, but I would just say in this book, there are over a hundred contributors who are saying in so many words that the lessons of the athletes of Special Olympics is what the world needs now. That's right. And, so let me shut up. I'm sorry. I'm no, no, no. I actually, I think what you said is true. I feel um, my intuition uh, to want to get involved with Special Olympics, you know, is led by the same philosophy that you have, which is the principles that we need, like you said, as human beings, we can learn from the athletes and leaders in this conversation. And I certainly have. And to talk about determination or respect or inclusion, is to say the world needs you guys to lead. What you That's have right. endured, what you've been through and what's required for you to be the excellent human beings that you are is what every man, woman and child out there needs. Mm -hmm. And so that inspiration that you are on the world stage um, locally, but also just as human beings to create a conversation here to talk about some of those principles. Nasha, you had talked to me a little bit about um, how hard you had to work on how you talk to yourself mm. you know like these are principles that all human beings need and you guys are excellent at them and in order to be the olympians that you are and to be the human beings you are you have had to work on yourselves with fearlessness and determination and resilience and um, I think some of those principles are also important to talk about because it, you, we, the Special Olympics is what the world needs now and that kind of leadership. So if you're inspired to talk about that part of our conversation, Nasha, I think people could truly benefit from that. Thank you so much. Uh, you know, at, in life, uh, no one applied to be born what he is or she is. So we need to accept each other as we are. You know, you, you, for example, Elizabeth, you, you haven't applied to be born. You want to be co you born as a female. You didn't apply for that. It just happened naturally. So we need to have that, that uh, love, that tolerance, that acceptance of accepting who we are and do, do it at our best. And uh, knowing in special Olympics, we, 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 we do this, be your brother's keeper and be your sister's keeper. You know, the wound of one is the wound of all. If the world uh, has got these values and principles, uh, I tell you it will be a better world. So coming back to your question, can you come on, can you, uh, back on your question so that uh yes just you know the work that you've done to talk to yourself with love and respect 
you've learned to talk to yourself with love and respect in a way um, that allowed you to have the determination and the resilience that you have. And yeah, I, how do you do that? <laughs> how do you do that? Most people wish they, they could do it. <laughs> like me. I like me too. <laughs> Thank you so much. You know, it, it's not easy because, uh, you know, you are silencing every voice of a critic. For example, no one was speaking positive. Actually, I still remember uh, even even in school, uh, I I I there was this uh, this other time that I I attempted to write the final exams. That's that the general O level exams. I I failed twice, and I passed the 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 third year, but the first two years it was a dismal failure, and everyone was still telling me, "Young men, you're useless. Young men, you're useless." But I had to think, I, I had to, I did, I did know like there was this voice inside me, young men, you can do it, even it's uh, difficult, even it's hard. Even what this, this other time that I used to go at some secret place, I think it's, it, it was a mountain where I go there, sit, sit, with, uh, sit on my own, you know, trying to start, start to speak to myself, motivating myself. Even when I used to run, I used to go to my secret, uh, some of the, uh, solitary places that I can tell I can do it, I can run, I can, I can become a better person, I can become a better speaker. And it happened day by day because I used to do it consistently. And you know, as even everything that you want to, every endeavor that you want to take in life, you had to practice it, practice many things perfect. So it was a routine, even in terms of meditating, even in terms of speaking to myself, motivating myself. It was not a once-off thing or a one-time thing. It, 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 becomes, it, it becomes an attitude. It becomes a, a behavior. It becomes a character. So, and also a few other people, few teachers, and few other people have seen potential in me. Uh, they helped me to be to to become who I am today. So I really thank them, and I really thank that voice that was telling me every day that you can do it. You're not different from other people. Yeah, and you are the most. You are so strong, and like Tim said, I am working on those qualities inside myself. So it's for me. I benefit so much from talking to you about how you really became strong as an athlete. Um, personally, it, it's a, I reflect on it a lot in my own personal life. Um, Emmanuel, I wanted to talk to you about respect. You and I have talked a lot about respect um, and what your thoughts are on self-respect and mutual respect between human beings. Yes, I think respect is one of the things that we're dismissing a lot because uh, there are always people that want to, to point out and judge you not not even know you they don't they don't want to stop and listen to you they just want to to point out and judge and uh i think respect it, it, it needs to be not only for other person but also for yourself you need to like nasha say you need to to respect yourself you need to understand yourself to be well with yourself and then um i think it, we sometimes we we push a lot. Sometimes we we are kind of stressed, and uh, sometimes we don't believe in, in ourselves. But we need to 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 see and to think that yes, we I am capable. I, I have to respect myself, my ideas, my feelings, and uh, I have to work with people around me. Uh, accepting the the differences, accepting the people not always have the same time to learn as you have. So you have to respect this person's time because if you help each other, everyone, you get it to the goal of, of inclusion, respect, love, mm. support each other. And uh, I think we need it. We need it. We need to show everyone that we can be a better, we can have a better place. We can be better for everyone not only for ourselves, but also for a person that is, is right by right next to us. 
we just need to to listen we just need to give an opportunity for this person to express and then we can learn from from them I agree. And it's funny because Timothy and I know each other through a friend who created an organization called the Choose Love Movement. And love is at the center of Special Olympics. And I don't mean love, I mean like love. Love is at the center of Special Olympics. And so I actually wanted to mention that. I think Scarlett is here listening to us. Um, but I want to and Scarlett's in this book too. Just, just <laughs> Scarlett's own book, Nurturing Healing Love, is fantastic. We can just put a plug in for yes. everybody following Scarlett. Uh, and I'm very uh, proud that she, I hope she's well. I hope she's doing whatever she she should be doing. But uh, if she's listening, I, I want to thank her again for contributing to this uh, call to unite, which is you know her contribution. Uh, can I just go back just for a second, Elizabeth? Because I just yeah. want to. I'm sure you get it to Kira next, but just want to point out how powerful a couple of things Nasha just said about silencing the voice of the critic and having a, a regular practice if I'm again I just wrote down of a secret place or a solitary place uh, I think this is you know he's I, just given us something that you know some of the greatest spiritual leaders in all religious traditions teach us that uh, you have to go to that quiet place. Uh, yes, get support from people, as Nasha said, and Emmanuel, as you said, get support, work with people, respect people, uh, and silence the inner critic, because you can't only respect people as much as you respect yourself. And you can only love, I, I think, others as much as you actually love yourself. And if you've done the work, as Nyasha does, if you not, not just did it once, but do it over and over again, like you're saying, you know, it's not one time thing. Right? It's a, it's like a practice. You know, they say like doctors practice medicine or lawyers practice law. In Special Olympics, we practice resilience and self-compassion and respect uh, through these kinds of strategies Nyasha is teaching us. Anyway, I just think it's so beautiful. Um, no, I, and I invite everybody listening or watching to write those words down, silencing the voice of the critic, which is yeah. your voice. It's your voice who's the critic. Well, and I've got to tell you guys, personally, on a personal note, the Respect Project has become my quiet place. Mm -hmm. These beautiful. talks, whether they, no matter what the topic, they are so sacred to me and they've become my spiritual guiding light. In fact, I have to say that Tim and I are going to be doing a talk April 18th about the Unite movement and continuing these topics, these conversations on respect. But this quote that your mom said, Tim, let me win, but if I cannot win, let me be brave in the attempt. And what you're talking about is how we have to keep always attempting to, I'm on location shooting a movie, so I'm gonna have to. If you wanna go on mute for a second, we can, you want us to talk for a sec? Yeah, okay, so uh, maybe, I, I get to throw it over to Kira if I could. Can I, I don't know, Kira, if you're ready for this question, but I'd love to hear um, you comment on this. What I hear is like a little bit of a balancing act. Nasha's saying the silent, the inner critic, and Emmanuel reminding us about trusting others. And I wonder if you could share with us how you balance the need to be positive within and the need to be trusting with others. Does that? Does that resonate with you at all, that challenge? It does. It is really difficult to be able to do both because when I was younger, I was in quite a dark place with being bullied at school. It wasn't a great experience. And because I wasn't very academic, my whole world I thought was the end of because I was told you need to get your grades, you need to get your grades. And if you don't, that's that. But through the Special Olympics and the friendships and the skills as well, it's not just about the medals and the trophies and the tangible things. It's the intangible lessons that you get of growth, of learning how to socialize, mm. how to be a mentor, how to be a best friend and how to help others. And for me, I've learned that through the experiences of being here today, working with Nasha beforehand in other product, 
projects with Manu as well in different times. And I said to Lizzie as well, when I'm with new people, I learn different skills. And if you get it wrong, don't worry, we all make mistakes. It's a learning process. And sometimes quite a lot of people worry that, how do I interact with people with ID? What do I do? What should I say? But the first thing I'd say to somebody is just say hi. Try and get to know somebody first. Ask those simple questions to get more knowledge. Mm -hmm. And for me, for my balancing, I have my work that I do. But my downtime, that time that helps me just go, ah, okay, is my diamond out. I'm working with fellow athlete leaders and spending time with my athlete friends and my family. Thank you, Tim, for asking that question. I think the alarm has has stopped going off here. <laughs> um, Stunning answer, beautiful, Kira. Yeah, yeah go that's back to you, Elizabeth. Kira. No, not at all. In fact, it was so, we're, we're we're psychically linked because I was going to ask Kira how does she contribute to the goals of other athletes, and really, I mean, this is what we're all talking about. Um, so, thank you, Kira, for that answer. Um, I know somebody specifically wants to ask you, Tim. Um, are there any specific initiatives being considered globally to encourage a greater level of participation in Special Olympics by persons with ID, especially in light of any decrease in athlete, athlete numbers due to COVID-19? Does that question make sense? Yeah, uh, um, okay. a couple of things. I mean, we've, we, we've uh, in recent years, thanks to the generosity of the, gov of the uh, Crown Prince of Abu Dhabi, we've opened and expanded into 20 new countries. So these are some of uh, the world's poorest countries where we've had trouble in the past. Many of them have been struggling with violence or even war, but we've started there. So adding and bringing the message to places that have experienced great adversity is a new challenge. Well, it's not a new challenge. We're just growing in that challenge. I'd say that's number one. Number two, a big way for us to grow is to get Special Olympics programs into schools. Uh, many of us, for instance, in the United States, you grow up and sports is at school. But sports at school is usually for just a very small number of people. Uh, there's one basketball team and maybe it has 10, 15 people, or maybe there's two basketball teams, 20, in a school of 1,000. We want there to be not just a varsity team in every school uh, for boys or for girls, but also a Special Olympics unified team in every school, uh, in every sports club in the world. These are the institutions already responsible for providing sports opportunities, but they often don't for our, for our folks. So we wanna grow what we call unified champion schools. Elizabeth, it's a really interesting idea, which is that sports actually teaches in schools the simple lessons of an inclusive mindset. We think that's really important because we think people, like we think that's the thing the world needs more than anything is an inclusive mindset. What Kira just said, the intangibles, mm. we, need, we need to teach the intangibles. How, li, listen to what you, how to be a best friend, how yeah. to be a mentor, how to listen. Where is that taught today? It's not in sixth grade science. It's not in third grade reading. It's not in ninth grade history, uh, but it is in Special Olympics. You know, so we want to expand in those ways and, 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 and use a lot more digital tools to respond to the pandemic. Sorry, I'll stop going on. No, I, it's, I mean, this is, this is it, guys. This is the respect talk. It's all about this. And Kira, I was going to actually ask you because you, you, you actually teach children with intellectual disabilities, but also children without intellectual disabilities. And I was going to ask you, which I think is very much what Tim is saying, what you were just beginning to talk about, you know, what, what would you teach any child? Because the way Special Olympics is gonna expand is the way the world should expand. And you're doing it every day by teaching children also without intellectual disabilities, how to live by these principles. So, you know, what would you wanna impart on any child? I would say that the lessons that we spoke about is it starts with them. You can only start to be positive when you accept yourself and you like yourself. That's how I started. And I also say that if you have a dream, you can achieve it and you shouldn't let anybody stop you. You shouldn't let people put barriers in your way. You should shatter them, as Tim said before, and don't back down. And just try and stay happy. But if you're not happy, talk to each other 
talk to your friends, the friends who don't have ID. If you see somebody who's struggling in the playground or at work or at colleges or universities, go over, see how they're doing, try and make a friend and help them out as well. It's a two-way process for me. I always say learning is a two-way process. We can't expect the person with a disability to do all the work, but we can't expect the person without to do all the work. It's partnership and it should become equal and have that diversity and equality, which will help bring in the inclusion and make our world more of an inclusive world for everybody. Mm. Yes. That's beautiful. Actually, Andrew Bard, who's here, uh, wanted to ask each of you, your path to becoming the leaders you are today is truly inspiring. He said, was there a specific piece of advice someone told you during your journey that you've kept that you've kept with you and passed along to others who may be struggling? Um, Nasha or Emmanuel, do you want to answer that? And Kira also. Emmanuel, you want to answer that? Yeah, sure. Uh once my, a person said to me is to believe in myself no matter what people say just believe in yourself don't let uh, others opinions negative opinions to impact you if you believe in yourself you can go far and you can reach your goals so that's what i, I, mean, I was i was trying to to talk to the athletes just believe in yourself don't don't care about the negative thoughts and uh, if you believe in yourself you, no one can stop you nasha what is one uh, one thing someone said to you that you carried with you that you always turn to uh, thank you so much uh i still remember there was this that this at the time i was trying to to speak in English. So there was this uh, teacher who was, uh, who, he, he was best in uh, teaching literature at, at, at the mainstream, but I was in special class. So he, he, he met me and said, young man, you're a great person. You need, to, you need to develop yourself. He told me about this man called John Wesley. He said there was this man who was called John Wesley. He started his, his, his own teach, and he was telling me he was something like Monty. So it, I didn't get the sense. I didn't know about who was John Wesley by that time. And I stood myself there. He said to me, young man, you need to, you've got the great potential. And he is telling me I get great potential after all the humiliation that I'm suffering at school, uh, after the, the fail, I, I failed all the grades with that. Did and he's telling me, yeah, many of the potential. Then from that moment, yeah, I knew that there was something that that is within me that I need to harness, that I need to nature. And uh, I've used that in my motivation, that in my motivation speech, because I normally go into high schools for on voluntary basis, training them, um, motivating them, even going an extra mile. I go into all high schools in my community and uh, within beyond my communities as well, teaching young kids to how to love, love one another, how to, be, uh, how to foster inclusion. So it has really helped me a lot. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much for saying that. Well, he would be very proud of you knowing that you are now on the board of Special Olympics, right? I just heard that you were nominated by all the other athletic leaders. That's amazing. Thank you. You are, you are excellent in every way. Tim, I have a question because I respect you so much. And just, I'm curious if you could teach the world and people one lesson, what would it be? I think not to be afraid of the judgment of others, um, mm. not to be afraid. Um, I think we spend so much time afraid. Um, and one of the one of the authors I've read recently says, you know, the opposite of love is not hate, it's fear. And the more fear you have, the more love you need. And the more fear you feel, the more love you need to give. And um, I, I feel like so much of who we are, when we are free, I've learned from the athletes of Special Olympics, you know, there's a freedom 
to not let the judgment of others define you. When you see our athletes, uh, you know, running the hundred meters in 40 seconds and putting, you know, your arms up in the air as a victor, you know, and, and the, the world looks on that and says, you should, you know, aren't you embarrassed that that's, that you can't run as fast as some other people or aren't you embarrassed that you're not as fast as uh, the people that ran early? Aren't you embarrassed that you're slow compared to me? No, not embarrassed. That's my best. That's what I do. I run it in 40 seconds and it's gorgeous world. Get used to it. And um, every one of these athletes today has reminded me not to be afraid. Uh, and you know, that's a, it's a tough lesson, Elizabeth. A lot of, you know, you're, you're in the entertainment business. Uh, people tell you all day long to be afraid of aging, to be afraid of not getting a part, to be afraid of uh, being in a movie that's not a hit, to be afraid of being cast in a secondary role, all that, right? It's all fear, fear, you should be afraid. Be, you know, otherwise you're going to lose this, you're going to lose that. And all these athletes, every one of them has just said one thing over and over to me, to my heart, don't be afraid. <laughs> don't be afraid. And maybe they learned it from someone else. Maybe they learned it, you know, from a deep place deep within themselves. Uh, but uh, every time I go to, it's why I, I, I love, people say, well, you've been to so many Special Olympics events. You've probably been to 10,000. I said, yeah, 10,000, but I can't wait for 10,001. Because it's just another, it's like Nasha said earlier, it's a, it's a practice, you know, you don't learn to silence the critic, you practice. Yes. Practice. So I go to these events, just looking for cues, for clues, for support. Right. Less afraid. To have, to have your cup be filled up and runneth over. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I, I, <laughs> no, I agree. And, and, and one of the many reasons I created the Respect Project, and you know, Tim, I talked to you about it when it was just a new, a new baby, a new beginning, was to say, we need each other. We need to talk. We need community. We need to listen. We need to hear each other's stories. We need to be inspired by each other. Right. And the only way we do that is by, like you said, listening to each other's stories. And what I've heard is very similar to what you've heard, which is what we need now is to is to you know really I think all of us in in every aspect of life really hold on to these principles of Special Olympics as guiding principles as spiritual life guiding principles, and you know your mom said something um, at one point I was reading about it she said like uh, something like do your best do it properly and then move on like a victor yeah, yeah. you know like just this yeah. And Kira said it earlier, you know, it doesn't mean skill isn't important. Remember, Kira, you were talking about skills, you know, both on the playing field and off skills. We need, you know, we need to learn skills. But the first skill, the first skill, I think, is to, you know, and by the way, I didn't come up with this. I think it's the expression that's the most common expression in the Bible. Now, I know not everybody is, believes, you know, uses the West, you know, the Jew Jewish or the Christian Bible. But still, it's interesting to know the expression that comes up the most is don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. That's all over it. You know, it's all over it. And, you know, you're right. We need compassion. We need respect. We need love. But the first thing we got to do is not be afraid to show it. You know, because sometimes people make fun of you. When right. You believe in others. <laughs> and, oh, you believe in them. You talk to them. You, you're working with them. You're trusting those people. Yeah. There's a lot of that. And what, you know, what I hear uh, Emmanuel saying is, yeah, yeah, I do. I'm taking a chance on them. Yeah, they may look to you like they're not good for this or not good for that, or they have a bad opinion about something. Maybe they do have a bad opinion about something, but maybe I'm going to take a chance on them anyway. Well, and, and, like, <laughs> and, and, and like you said, I mean, the judgment of people with intellectual disabilities is so unfortunate because if you would sit there and you would listen, I have more wisdom. I've learned more. I've, I've, I've acquired more wisdom and shared in more, like you said, shared experience, shared outlook, skills I'm working on as a person through my friendship with Kira, Emmanuel, and Nasha that I think to myself, like, if not you, then who? I say that to myself every day. 
you know, when I'm afraid, like Tim said, and I'm afraid to try a new challenge, or I'm afraid to, you know, be strong or, or meet the challenges that life presents. So, you know, again, um, you know, having a conversation with you guys, again, I, I really think these are guiding human principles. Um, and you guys are beautiful human beings that are there leading the world, leading the world stage, not the Special Olympics stage. Exactly. That's right. Yeah. yeah. So everybody's tuning into the morning shows and the nightly news and the MS this and the Fox that and the New York Times or the London Times, whatever. Uh uh. You can't get it there. It's not coming from there. It's coming right here. It's coming right. from Nasha and Kira and Manu. I mean, and I know they would say they're brothers and sisters around the world in, in this movement. So they, they just got it. I mean, they just, you, you guys, you got it. I mean, I don't know what else to say. Just keep sharing it, you know, keep sharing. And a lot of the people I, I'm see, looking at the chat, I see Ron, my friend Ronald, Wein, Ronald Weintraub who's on, which is wonderful. And people from our team, you know, believe it or not, Elizabeth, you know, you've, you see people on who work for Special Olympics who are joining this because they want this, right? Not, not, not because it's their job. See Jim Barbie, our, uh, who leads our finance team right now. I mean, he's watching this from home on a Sunday afternoon because he needs, he needs, I'm guessing, I want to speak for Jim, but uh, he, he needs a shot, you know, he needs a dose. He yeah. Needs, he needs a little, he needs a daily, he said, he said, daily he dose. Said, he said, you're right. You're right. <laughs> um, well, to be quite honest, I needed this talk. Um, I needed to be welcomed into the Special Olympics family. And my heart through our friend Scarlett Lewis led me to you, Tim, and to be included. And I really, I, I really want to thank each of you guys. I mean, I really do think that you are a shining light for the world. Um, your mom said this. She said, you, your presence sends a message to every village, every city, every nation. And it's the message is a message of hope. And that's what you're talking about when it comes to being fearless. And so I just want to thank you guys. If you guys who are with us have any questions, we'll, you know, hang in there. But um, I just want to thank Nasha. It's very late where you are. It's, <laughs> it's I think, now 9 p.m. And Emmanuel, it's late in Brazil. And so I just want to thank you guys. Um, it's food for life, somebody here said, and the joy of life to be together, a burst of joy and oxygen on this Sunday evening in London. Thank you to all of you. Um, thank you for this inspirational discussion and inspired leadership, hope, and light. So um, I love you guys. Thank you for your time, your heart, your energy, your leadership for yourselves and for others. Um, should we drop the mic? <laughs> <laughs> thank you, guys. Okay, thanks, you guys. Thank you so thank much. You. Such a great discussion, Nancy said, and so important. Um, and for those of you who are with us, the next Respect Project talk, if you didn't catch the hints, is going to be on the movement of, of Unite with Timothy Shriver. Yes, April 18th. Just, it's just trying to teach the world the Special Olympics message and it with, a, with, a new, with more, more outlets, that's all. <laughs> I cannot wait. So thank, thank you, you guys for coming. Thank you, Jason. Thank you, Emily. Thank you, Special Olympics family. And Kira, Emmanuel, Nasha, I love you. Thank you for your beautiful hearts. Thank you so much. Thank you.